second. Takes a second. There you go. Uh, there you go. There's a second. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna lead off with a, a joke. So uh, I'll ask you a question. Show of hands on uh, how many actually uh, uh, know what they think the answer is. But uh, what do you call a situation? How would you describe a situation where your network interface card overheats after you connect to the internet? So you may show of hands for anybody who thinks they know the answer. The answer is, it burns when I pee. <laughs> if I'm gonna end on a high note, this is where I would uh, drop the mic. <laughs> uh, for this presentation, I'm gonna do, uh, 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 do an introduction uh, using Security Onion in a uh, virtual environment, how I use it. Uh, using Security Onion with a physical setup live monitoring, uh, carving and sanitizing the uh, PCAP files, and replaying those uh, PCAP files. Uh, I gotta warn you, there are uh, some pretty big words in this presentation. They're not long, they just uh, have a larger than normal font. <laughs> so the introduction, uh, uh, currently I'm employed by uh, Palo Alto Networks Unit 42, which is the public face of threat research for Palo Alto Networks. There are other people uh, that do threat research in the company that support the product, but uh, uh, those of us on the Unit 42 team are uh, uh, producing uh, uh, reports and uh, uh, information for public consumption. And of course, uh, we already talked about malwaretrafficanalysis.net, uh, and uh, me being a uh, handler at the uh, Internet Storm Center and doing diaries. And then, uh, uh, as always, I tend to, to tweet quite a bit on uh, at malware underscore traffic on Twitter. Now, I first discovered Security Onion in the uh, 1204 era um, in late uh, 2013, uh, shortly after I started doing the blog. Um, prior to that, uh, has anybody read the uh, um, uh, Richard Betlick's uh, book, The Tao of Security? It's kind of an old book. Uh, he has a new one out uh, called The Practice of Network Security Monitoring, uh, by North Starch Press, uh, who's one of the sponsors, and that's an excellent book, which actually goes into Security Onion. But uh, uh, that, that older book, uh, they, he was setting up, I believe it was Snort on uh, FreeBSD. And uh, I tried doing that, and I just could not master it. Uh, when Security Onion came along, and uh, there's an uh, icon there that says Set Up, and it helped me just walk me through the process. I loved that. Now, uh, uh, during my normal line of work, uh, when I'm doing research, when I'm trying to uh, come up with material for the blog, uh, I usually look into traffic uh, affecting systems running Microsoft Windows as opposed to uh, OS X or Android or what have you. So let's look at uh, uh, how I'll generally use Security Onion in a virtual environment. So with the, uh, with the virtual environment, uh, the virtual environment that I recommend is uh, VMware. Uh, basically because of ease of use. Uh, there are a lot of smart people in this room who uh, can use other virtualization environments for this purpose. But uh, for me, I, I tend to focus more on the analysis. Uh, uh, I'm not quite as technical as I'd like to be at times. So uh, 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 VMware uh, workstation, the paid for version for Windows or Linux or VMware Fusion for Mac is uh, uh, if I'm doing a virtualization environment uh, uh, working with VMs, that's how I'll tend to work. I've also used uh, 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 KVM, uh, the kernel virtual mode on uh, uh, Linux uh, um, and virtual machine manager. And I've tried once or twice, I've tried VirtualBox is that uh, still supported by Oracle? Is that still being patched and updated? It, it, you know, I tried it once and uh, I had uh, some trouble setting it up the way I liked it. I know uh, quite a, uh, uh, probably about four or five people that uh, have used it and they prefer using that for their virtual environments. But those are the big three. Does anybody know any other virtual environments that you might use for uh, uh, something like this? Not like ESXi, but something you can use within uh, Windows or, or OSX? Pardon? Hyper-V. Hyper-V, uh, that's right, that's right. I have not tried Hyper-V yet. So when I'm running a, uh, uh, a VM environment, uh, the physical host I'm running the VM in, 
should have. These are the recommendations that, uh, that I recommend. You could probably get away with a little less, but uh, this is what I would recommend. Uh, 16 gigs of RAM for your CPU uh, should have a, a quad-core i7. Anything with uh, uh, hyper-threading on there, so you got uh, eight ver uh, 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 cores, so to speak. Um, some laptops where they have an i7, it's actually a dual core. Uh, uh, stay away from that. Or if you're going the AMD route, uh, six or eight cores. And then uh, finally, uh, my recommendation is a uh, 500 gig uh, SSD. You can get away with uh, 250, uh, uh, but eventually you'll run up uh, against some constraints if you're doing anything else on the computer. And uh, you can use a, a, a regular hard drive as opposed to solid state, but that's uh, much, much, much slower. So you have your physical host running a virtualization environment. You've got your Windows VM. And you got your security onion VM. The important thing here uh, uh, for me that I did not know when I first started out, that I do know now, is that I should use a VPN. Uh, if for nothing else, then when you infect your computer and it starts uh, uh, this VM that you have and it starts acting as a spam bot, and then all of a sudden one weekend on a Sunday afternoon you find you have no internet, <laughs> call your service provider and I said yeah we shut you down because your computer's infected it's like Dah. had to explain so using a VPN is very important it hides your actual IP address like I said uh, you also have location specific URLs or malware uh, uh, that you may run across uh, a lot of uh, Brazilian uh, malicious spam will have links to uh, uh, malware to download but uh, uh, at first, when I first ran across this, I would click on the link, I'd get a 404 not found, and I thought, oh, you know, great, the service providers took it down, until somebody uh, informed me one day through uh, Twitter or through the uh, email that, uh, hey, uh, it's location specific. Um, so VPNs uh, are very helpful, uh, especially those VPNs where you can pick which, uh, which country uh, that you have your IP address from. And finally, uh, you may have to switch IP addresses before you can uh, uh, reinfect your virtual machine. Uh, I find this a lot with exploit kits. So I've got a uh, compromised website that I'm using to get ready to kick off an infection uh, chain. I successfully do it, uh, but something goes wrong and I need to reinfect the VM. So uh, I, I go back and if I'm using that same IP address uh, uh, nine times out of ten, it will not work. So you have a physical host using a VPN, running virtualization environment. So for your Windows VM, you want to have a dual core CPU, two gigs of RAM, uh, and uh, 24 gigs of uh, uh, hard drive space or disk space at a, uh, at a minimum. The reason I say uh, uh, two cores is uh, it was either uh, uh, Drydex or uh, uh, Dire uh, a while back that was uh, checking to see if uh, the machine that it was being run on had two cores or not. And I want to say that was within the past year or so. And uh, uh, so I just do this as a matter of course. For the uh, Security Onion VM, um, I, I think this is a, a relatively standard dual core and four gigs of RAM, so that's recommended. And uh, 60 gigs of uh, disk space on a, on a VMware, uh, um, and I'm not sure about VirtualBox, um, it, it uh, the amount of uh, space taken up on your physical machine for the VM is uh, only as much as uh, uh, the files that are being stored. So you're not like uh, carving out 60 gigs if you're using VMware on your Windows machine, uh, taking up the full 60 gigs of drive space unless you fill it up. Which on Security Onion, if you enable all the defaults, is uh, really easy to do. So when I set up Security Onion in a virtual environment, I'll set it up as a standalone, not a server or a sensor, but both. And uh, I'll use the Emerging Threats uh, or Emerging Threats Pro rule set with Suricata or um, the uh, Snort uh, uh, Talos uh, rule set with Snort. Uh, you, can, you can switch them around if you want. You can use ET with uh, Snort. You can use uh, uh, the Snort roof set with Suricata, but uh, uh, generally, it, you know, they, they're made to be used this way. So uh, I, I don't 
I generally don't tend to mix and match. And uh, normally when I'm uh, personally working with Snort, I'll uh, just have that on a, a separate, uh, I've got a Debian VM that I have Snort on uh, and pulled pork set up and uh, uh, where I can tweak that uh, a little bit easier than I can within Security Onion. The thing I like about Security Onion is you can uh, uh, just go through and set it up and uh, uh, just click your way through. So if you're going through the setup, you only have one interface. Uh, I'll use DHCP instead of uh, trying to set up a, a static IP address environment because I really don't care at this point uh, what the IP address is of uh, my machine. Uh, then you'll have to reboot and uh, uh, once you've set up the interfaces and then uh, uh, setting up uh, the rest of it, um, going into production mode because you got a little bit more of, uh, of um, uh, uh, control over uh, what you have and not going best practices but I'm going custom and in this case for the purposes of this uh, presentation I'm going to use Suricata why because I'm going to use the emerging threats uh, uh, open rule set and uh, I'm using this in this case because it's the only one that does not uh, the only option that you have here that does not require an OINT code you can get an OINT code uh, pretty easily by going to uh, snort.org and uh, registering, uh, not necessarily subscribing and paying any money, but you could register for the uh, snort rule set, and that will give you a, uh, uh, a much more um, uh, uh, robust set of rules than the uh, uh, snort community rule set. And, uh, you know, at first when I saw this, it's uh, you know, asking me if I wanted to enable the IDS engine. Uh, my response was, duh. But uh, there are certain situations I can uh, see where you would not want, to, where you could be running Security Onion but not using the IDS. <coughs> I will enable Bro. Bro is awesome mainly because I can extract any executables that come up in the PCAP. Now you can do this in general uh, by taking the PCAP and uh, uh, exporting HTTP objects in Wireshark. But uh, sometimes the, uh, uh, the TCP segments are out of order or uh, uh, something is uh, uh, a little janky with the, the traffic in the PCAP and you might not be able to do it through Wireshark. Uh, this is a very easy way to make sure that if there are executable files that are being sent in the clear over HTTP or uh, uh, possibly FTP, some other protocols that you can uh, uh, get that through Bro. I do want full packet capture. Uh, full packet uh, capture is uh, uh, really how I grew up uh, uh, when I started in this field. Um, it, it seems like a lot of people started with uh, reviewing uh, uh, system logs uh, before moving over to traffic. Uh, for me, it was kind of uh, the reverse situation uh, where I actually uh, have been uh, fortunate enough to have access to full packet capture when I first started out and uh, was really, really, really amazed uh, from my coworkers that didn't exactly see the value in all that. So after I go through uh, all the options, everything else uh, uh, you can give or take, those are the ones that I make sure that I uh, uh, have uh, in my personal environment. Uh, I'll go through and uh, I believe it was uh, uh, Doug that actually told me uh, a couple years back that um, some of the uh, alerts that I thought I should be seeing uh, I wasn't seeing. That's because uh, uh, whether you're using Snort uh, or whether you're using the emerging threats rule sets, uh, there are quite a few rules that are disabled by default that at, when I'm doing this sort of research, I want to see anything that could possibly fire on it. So I'll want to uh, 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 change the uh, pull port configuration to enable all the signature IDs. And I love the fact that uh, ID is an abbreviation for identification because, uh, what is it, I is short for I and D is short for identification. <laughs> anyway, there's your, uh, there's your path uh, to uh, edit the enablesid.conf. Once I do that, oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, you're going to add uh, PCRE colon alert as uh, the last line of the file. So it's basically telling you to enable any uh, signature that has the string alert in it. 
And then I'll go ahead and do a rule update after I do that, because you set up uh, Security Onion, it will do it. But uh, once you uh, uh, tweak the uh, configuration file, you're going to have to do the rule update again to enable all those signatures that were disabled by default. And of course, it will uh, um, restart uh, Barnyard and it will restart whatever IDS you're using, Snort or Suricata. So once you've done that, uh, uh, you're ready to go. So using Security Onion with a physical setup, somewhat similar. So you got your physical Windows host and you got your uh, physical Security Onion host. Uh, uh, using VMware in a virtual environment, by default, your two virtual machines are on the same virtual LAN. And Security Onion working uh, in promiscuous mode is going to capture all the, uh, uh, all the packets. Uh, you don't exactly, uh, you've got to be able to mirror that option here in the physical world. So uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll just uh, have some uh, cheap switch. Uh, for me, personally, I got uh, 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 Cisco uh, 2960 uh, switch off of uh, eBay uh, for relatively cheap. If you're, uh, you know, uh, showing the network diagram for the whole thing, uh, you know, going out if you're doing it at home or uh, possibly at work, uh, you know, that switch is going to a router to the internet. And I think with uh, home routers, uh, 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 there's the, the, the port that goes to the, uh, in your internet connection, but uh, the other four ports in a home router may be uh, considered part of the same uh, uh, switch uh, environment, in which case you wouldn't need, uh, you wouldn't exactly need uh, this thing here. But uh, for the sake of the diagram, you know, here's what we got. Now, based on the virtual environment, what do you guys think is missing? You need a separate, you need a management port on your security on your host, and you're also going to need the promiscuous port. Well, that's true, but uh, in this case, I can set them up both the, the same way, uh, um, uh, where it is both the management and, uh, and the sensor. Uh, it, it'll work just the same as it would in virtual environment, but what in this diagram is missing here that was in my uh, uh, VM representation drawing. VPN. VPN. VPN, exactly. So in order to uh, uh, overcome that, basically between the router and the switch that I have, I've got a uh, computer that has uh, 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 two Ethernet ports. One of them is uh, going to the router, the other is going to the switch. And uh, uh, in this case, I use Ubuntu, and you can easily uh, share Ethernet ports there. And I've got, uh, I've got a, a VPN service running on that, and uh, it, it will easily uh, uh, go to the shared Ethernet port. And then voila, I've got a physical machine that's hooked up to a switch, as far as it can tell, is going directly out of uh, Afghanistan or Cuba or uh, uh, North Korea or wherever I can get a uh, IP address from. Now this is, uh, this is a, uh, a situation that I uh, uh, currently have. Uh, I've also had this because uh, um, in many cases I'm uh, using TCP replay to play back the PCAP as opposed to uh, trying to monitor it live. For a physical setup, uh, uh, setting up Security Onion is generally the same as the setup for virtual environments except that you naturally have uh, more resources available for packet capture and logs and all that. I mean, when's the last time uh, anybody uh, saw an 80 gig uh, hard drive in the last five years? No hints. Uh, so once you got your uh, virtual or physical environment set up, you can do live monitoring. And I've done this before, whether it's physical or uh, virtual. Uh, you can see the alerts as they happen, that's kind of neat. But uh, it is currently a method I rarely use for live monitoring. Uh, why? It's because it is, a, uh, uh, it is more suited toward uh, uh, near real-time detection and response, not really the, the type of uh, research that I do for uh, posting PCAPs on the web and trying to get malware samples. I don't need to see it as it's happening, I just need to see it. Live monitoring on a VM is problematic since uh, some malware, um, a good portion of malware is uh, VM aware. So uh, with that particular setup, uh, it, it's uh, maybe about a 50-50 shot 
when I'm uh, doing exploit kit activity, uh, I can get the exploit kit traffic fairly well, but when the malware actually comes through and affects the machine, it may do nothing. If it detects, it's in a virtual environment. And then I don't have a good uh, representation of traffic from a truly you know, infected machine, which is why uh, live monitoring in a uh, physical setup is uh, much more desirable, but it's uh, a bit more effort to set up and maintain. So let's take a look at uh, an example of live monitoring. I don't have it in the video here, and I'm not going to do a uh, demo because uh, I saw how the last one went. But uh, here is a uh, uh, campaign I'm currently tracking, uh, uh, trying to figure out. This is a uh, uh, Portuguese malicious spam uh, going to a Brazilian uh, company. Uh, it's got a link uh, that will return a JavaScript file that will uh, uh, with a JS uh, file extension, once you double click it, it'll infect the computer. <coughs> so uh, I tend to use Squill. Uh, I, I love using Squill because it's um, the, the closest uh, 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 thing that I've seen so far that I don't have to pay for that I can get something that feels a little bit like ArcSight or QRadar or some of the other bigger sims and it's completely free. I'm going to log in, and uh, I'm just going to listen on the, uh, uh, the, the particular Ethernet port. I don't care about the uh, OSSEC uh, for the type of stuff that I'm looking at. I'll use the F3 key to clear any existing events of the queue. I got everything set up. I go ahead and click on that link, execute that JS file, and then boom, I've got a bunch of alerts, not all at once. And I seriously thought about doing some sort of uh, GIF or video that shows them scrolling out just for a little bit of a wow factor, but uh, no. Nah. Take a closer look. Now what we have here, uh, we're going through, and this is the Emerging Threats Open Signature Set. And you can see at the very uh, end there, you've got uh, some uh, non-standard IRC traffic on TCP port 443. Uh, you've got some uh, other suspicious downloads, and you've got something that uh, that Emerging Threats Alert is calling a Mikey Variant HTTP Command and Control Beacon 3. Since uh, something was downloaded, I checked my uh, 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 Bro Extracted folder. And then I'm going to go through the daily log so I can get the traffic. Now if I want to share this traffic, and I have to carve it to get rid of anything that's uh, uh, not included or that's not relevant to uh, what I'm uh, trying to look at. I'm going to try and sanitize it. Why do I want to carve and sanitize my PCAP? Once again, carve it to remove any unrelated traffic. It prevents, uh, hopefully, criminals from identifying some characteristics of your test environment. And uh, you can remove any data that you cannot share. Uh, so I generally use Wireshark, a hex editor, and TCP rewrite when I'm sanitizing the PCAPs. So let's go back to this uh, snort log. I'm going to open it up, and I'll find out that uh, uh, 172.16.32.214 is the IP that I want, but there's another IP in there, and I believe that's the uh, uh, Security Onion host. So I'm going to go into Wireshark, and I'm going to carve that stuff out. Uh, uh, by putting that in the uh, command line, ip.addr equals uh, 172.16.32.214. Uh, I don't need IGMP. And you would think that if I'm filtering on an IPv4 address, I shouldn't need to specify that I don't want to see IPv6 traffic. Yeah. Unfortunately, I've uh, <coughs> uh, run into situations where I've, uh, I have found IPv6 traffic when I filter just on an IPv4 address. I don't know why, so I'll generally just put that in there. You may not want to do it because, uh, you know, there could be malware that uh, might be using IPv6. I haven't really found any yet, probably because I'm doing this. <laughs> Export. This is all fairly standard stuff. Uh, all packets displayed. Uh, I save it not in the, the next gen format, but just the regular PCAP format. Bless is my hex editor of choice. So I'll just uh, sudo apt get install bless. 
Uh, what do I want to use the hex editor? I want to change text strings uh, within the file that I find that may be revealing characteristics of my test environment. And I want to change MAC addresses. Now you can use TCP rewrite to change MAC addresses. And this is how I was doing it when I first discovered I could use TCP rewrite to change MAC addresses. The only problem is I started getting emails from people that were using my PCAPs saying that, uh, hey, I'm trying to use it in a test environment, but uh, 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 the uh, MAC addresses are jacking things up and it's not uh, working properly. Now there is a way to use TCP rewrite to, uh, uh, to change uh, without worrying about the direction of the uh, frame that's going back and forth. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, a little, uh, it's a little janky, I believe is the technical term for it. Uh, so uh, I'll just go ahead and uh, open it in uh, Bless. I'll go through and find and replace, make sure I'm using hexadecimal, and uh, I'll search for the the uh, MAC address, the hex value of the MAC address I'm wanting to replace with something that uh, uh, I've come up with to replace it with. Uh, to find it, you know, let's just say for the sake of argument, this is a uh, computer running a, a Biostar motherboard with e integrated Ethernet. You would find something like this. That's where you would get the information. And then you can change text strings in the PCAP. What type of text strings? Well, in this uh, particular example, uh, with the IRC traffic on port 443, you have, uh, um, uh, it can't resolve uh, the host name, so it uses my IP address, and this would be the IP address of the VPN that I'm using. Or if I'm at the library and I'm not using a VPN, it'd be the IP address that the library is using. Uh, either which way, I don't want them to know where I'm actually coming from. So uh, that is uh, not the real IP, by the way, but uh, it's one that I've already changed. It's important when you're editing text strings using a hex editor, uh, when you're editing the text strings in the PCAP that you use the same exact amount of characters uh, uh, to replace it. Uh, if you don't, if uh, say I've got uh, uh, five text characters, I'm gonna replace it with a, a string that's four characters long, it's gonna mess up the PCAP and you won't even be able to open it up in uh, Wireshark. And you also wanna double check with Wireshark the text strings that you did change because uh, TCP segments uh, may be out of order and it could happen right in the middle of that uh, uh, string that you had. And I found that uh, uh, before. So you're gonna go into uh, uh, Wireshark. You're gonna do, uh, use the find packet uh, function. You're gonna search for the string. You're gonna search packet details. You don't wanna do the packet list. You don't wanna do the uh, uh, packet bytes. You wanna do the packet details because it will show you uh, the details of the reassembled TCP string. Meanwhile, your, uh, uh, your bytes that are sitting it, uh, in your uh, PCAP in the hex editor are uh, out of order. That's a little tricky to kind of work around. And then uh, finally, using a hex editor on a PCAP will produce checksum errors in the uh, PCAP file. So I'll use TCP rewrite to fix the checksum errors. And uh, this is the format. So 172.16.32.0 slash 24. And then uh, normally the, the naming convention I'm using nowadays, I'm, I'm going to use another non-routable uh, IP address. So 10.9.10.0 slash 24 is the uh, ninth month and the tenth day today. So if I were doing something like this today, that's what I would use. Replaying PCAP files. When I uh, uh, replay them, I'll have squeal going because I want to see the alerts. And that's the tool I prefer. And then uh, terminal window. So without further ado, go in the terminal. Um, I'm going to uh, run rule update depending on uh, uh, when I've done uh, uh, when I've done this. Uh, I know you can do a cron job to have this set up to do it automatically. But uh, how many people here have run into a situation where an automated process that uh, was supposed to work did not? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Once again, I'm going to go into Squill. Once again, I'm going to uh, just do the uh, Ethernet port. And I'm going to use F3 to clear the existing events. 
Uh, for this example, I've gone into, uh, uh, into my blog and I'm grabbing uh, some traffic uh, with Locky. Okay, so there's Locky mouse spam here and it's going to, uh, um, it's going to uh, should give me some alerts on Locky, right? So uh, I'll use uh, TCP replay as uh, such. It'll go through. Interesting thing here is sometimes I'll go to uh, threatclass.com and get some PCAPs there and run them through just to check and see what uh, uh, Security Onion is telling me it is. And every once in a while, usually with those, I'll find a message that says, this packet has gone back in time. Has anybody seen that? Anybody done this? Where it, it's, it's amazing. I don't know how they can do that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, with the Emerging Threats Open rule set, here's what we uh, have for that Locky traffic, that Locky infection. Does anybody see Locky here? Now, the word Locky is not on there. Don't raise your hand, please. <laughs> <laughs> you may see stuff here that you say, oh, I know, that's Locky, because Locky only does that. But that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, I want an alert that says Locky. And I know the Emerging Threats uh, uh, Community Open rule set used to have that. Apparently it doesn't anymore, but you can submit your PCAP to Virus Total, and Virus Total will run it through Suricata and Snort, and it will use the Emerging Threats Pro rule set. And you can check, uh, there's a highlighted yellow portion there, and it will tell you if uh, uh, Snort for the, the Snort Talus rules and uh, Suricata for the Emerging Threats Pro. And if I check that, there is where I find the ET Pro rules that specifically say Locky. Because I'm just a dumb analyst, I couldn't uh, tell you that was Locky without it. So there is value in paid subscriptions for rule sets, or you can write your own. Uh, if uh, uh, Bad news here, folks. Uh, if you can afford to hire someone that can write their own uh, uh, snort rules, you could probably uh, save some money and just uh, go for the subscription instead. <laughs> so final thoughts. Criminals are always watching. Uh, I had some here about you should have a under understanding of networking for this line of work. Self-initiative is important. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Here's an email, speaking of don't be afraid to ask for help, uh, that I got in August uh, last month. Somebody wanted to use the blog, but they're a little confused on my vision on how to use the blog post as a learning tool. Can I please elaborate? <laughs> and and, and at, at first, I, I thought, oh, this is person doesn't work in security, you know, just somebody that kind of follows the blog. But uh, no, uh, uh, after I kind of responded as I would to somebody of that, it was like, no, you got me uh, wrong. I've been working in IT for 15 years. I've disassembled stuff. Uh, uh, I just don't have the experience in uh, uh, network traffic analysis. And uh, I finally had to tell this person, you know, I don't have a vision. It's provided for you to use as you will. Self-initiative. <laughs> And uh, the last thing I'll leave you guys with is uh, just like images or video, PCAPs can be altered. All right, so it's possible that PCAPs validity could be questioned. So www.google.com uh, I think is the same amount of characters as dougburks.com. And I can alter a PCAP and have people wonder why Doug Burks is using a Google search engine. <laughs> and that concludes the presentation. Uh, I'll be around for questions. Uh, I'm uh, here uh, today and tomorrow, and uh, I'm at Caesar's Palace next week. <laughs>